relationship. His um, father basically handed him over to his mother. And then my grandfather went about his life having multiple mistresses and living a pretty wild uh, life while my father was pretty much emasculated by his mother. Um, and those, those things that happened to him that shaped him were things outside his control. And so when he became an adult, it was very important to him to control the people that he could control, which in our instance was my mother, his wife, myself and my brother. With my mother, um, really what he did was um, verbal abuse. He controlled her by verbal abuse. And I remember, you know, just hearing him tell her terrible things, say terrible things to her, shut up, you're stupid. Um, I remember one time in, in front of me and my husband and my children, he screamed at her that she was just a dried up old woman. And I, I mean, I was horrified. Um, but I had learned early on, you know, to keep my mouth shut and try to keep a low profile. With me, the abuse was more physical. Um, I lived my life growing up in stark terror of fear of my father. He had a fraternity paddle and that's how he meted out punishment. And even until I was through high school, if I did something he didn't like, his response was to have me bend over and he whacked the living daylights out of me with this paddle. He would hit me so hard it would move me across the room and I can remember my mother standing by and just watching. I mean, she was too afraid to say anything for fear of what would happen to her. I've likened his, my father's rage, similarly to um, an alcoholic's drinking. When a child grows up in the home of an active alcoholic, a lot of times they try to manipulate things around them thinking, oh, if I do this differently, then daddy or mommy won't drink. If I don't say this word, uh, you know, maybe it, it'll be a better evening. And so when I was growing up, I learned um, the same types of behavior, trying to make sure that whatever I did or didn't do, didn't initiate his rage. Um, and I, I never could figure out, you know, how to make that stop. Uh, even as an adult, uh, he would rage periodically at me, but of course the, the beatings pretty much stopped after I left home because I wasn't there to, to be the recipient of anything, but um, growing up was very difficult with him. The way he controlled my brother um, was with money. I talked a little bit last time about what a gifted athlete my brother was, um, and he was truly a gifted athlete, but his ability to be an athlete really was restricted to high school. He was not tall enough to play college ball, but my father who insisted on living his life through my brother had fed him a line uh, of trying to tell him, oh, you're so wonderful, you can play college ball. Of course, he could not, and he was not successful um, in doing that. But because he had been named, because my brother had been named after my grandfather, the philandering grandfather. Um, and, and it's interesting to note that even though my father had to have been aware of what of the life that his father was engaging in as he was growing up, by the time I was born and my brother was born, that that grandfather had passed away and my father had revised history and had his grandfather or his father on a pedestal. And that's you know all I heard about was how wonderful his dad, my grandfather was blah, blah, blah. So my brother was named after my, our grandfather who in the miraculous way that people change history had become this out, you know, upstanding, pure, uh, wonderful person. And my father could not allow that memory to be sullied by having my brother not uh, be successful. My brother entered college. He had a good time playing around. Uh, he ended up in a shotgun marriage. He dropped out of school. Um, and my father started supporting him and his wife and ultimately their child uh, because that's just, you know, he wasn't going to let him fail. Um, it was just easier for my brother to do what daddy said 
in order to keep that money coming. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, later in, in this discussion. The messaging that came to me, you know, the messaging obviously to my brother was, you're the best athlete that's ever come out of Tennessee and all these colleges should want you and everyone should bow before you. The messaging to me was, um, you need to marry well. And, and the first step in my father's messaging to me that I was going to marry well was to send me to a private girls school, which we had no business sending me to because, first of all, we probably couldn't afford it. And secondly, that was not my, those, were, those people were not my peers. They were wonderful women. They were good, nice girls. But these were people who had actual servants. Some of them had actual servants. Um, I can remember going to being invited to one of their summer homes uh, on a weekend and we had gone, to, I'd gone up there to spend the night with this young girl. I was probably 13, 14, maybe. Well, we had to have lunch in the dining room and the mother, you know, there was a bell, a buzzer under the table. So she punched the buzzer and the servant came in with lunch. Um, which was fried chicken. Well, I'd never eaten fried chicken except by my fingers. And these people are eating them with a knife and a fork. And I, even at that young age, I understood that I had done something wrong. And I could tell by some of the ways that the mother made commentary. I mean, I was never invited back to that person's house. And I'm sure it had nothing to do with the young girl and probably not much to do with me. It's just, I didn't fit. But my father was convinced that um, I was going to fit and that the way I was going to fit and the way I was going to marry well was to be in this expensive school. Um, but I was different. You know, my, the girls I went to school with had name labeled clothes. Um, I didn't have that. They went to summer camps. Uh, we couldn't afford that. They um, would go on shopping trips to New York and Lord knows we couldn't afford that. And I mean, I remember my mother not buying a winter coat for years uh, because we couldn't afford that. And the money went to, you know, m m keeping me in that private school and my brother in a private school because above everything else to my father, you had to look good. You know, he, he had decided we were going to be a certain way. And so you had to look like that, except I didn't really have the tools or any of the accoutrements to really do what everyone else was doing. So all I heard in all these years in junior high, high school growing up was that um, money equal power. And, you know, I, I just don't think I really, it really resonated with me that much until something happened my senior year in high school. And the thing that happened was so significant to me. It had such a uh, deleterious effect on me that for years, and I mean decades, it colored how I saw the world and what I thought about money and power. And what it did for me is it convinced me that all that stuff I had heard from my dad growing up, money equals power and that's what you have to have. And it doesn't matter if you're pretty or you're smart or anything else, you just gotta have money and then you'll have power and things will be under your control. I decided he was right. So I, just, I also decided I would marry a rich man and that's what I looked for. And that's what I had been told all my life. I mean, I remember my mother saying, you can marry a rich man as well as you can marry a poor man. I mean, it was just on and on and on. So I ended up marrying a young man who I realized later was probably my emotionally damaged twin. Um, he came from a very wealthy family. They had had a Kentucky Derby winner. Um, when I met him, I was in my, I guess, first year of law, first or second year of law school. And he had been to seven colleges um, and was still a freshman in ours. Now, I mean, that should have told me something. But, you know, all I saw was, well, they owned a chain of bakeries and they had a Kentucky Derby winner. And this is the type of person that I've been instructed to marry. Um, we got married in a formal ceremony 
with 500 guests. And as I walked up the steps to the church, I knew I was making a mistake, um, but I could not back down. All those people were in the church. I'd gotten all those gifts. You know, what would, what would my father do to me if I turned to him and said, Daddy, I, this is a mistake and I can't do this? Because he knew the family. He had known both my future father and mother-in-law from college. And I mean, he and my mother were thrilled. I had achieved exactly what they had set me out to achieve. And I had been a good little girl uh, because I had taken all that messaging to heart and had, you know, married this rich man. And let me tell you, it was a marriage from hell. And I'm sure it was a marriage for, from hell as much for him, my husband, my then husband, as it was for me. But it took me years and years and years, um, a terrible divorce, um, a lot of work on myself to realize how badly I had hurt him uh, and how damaged he was um, with, you know, just as damaged as I was, but I couldn't see it. My brothers, the way he took the messaging um, was a, a different way. Although initially, when you, you look at how both of us were in our 20s and, and even into our early 30s, we probably were both playing out the role that had been created for us by our father. Um, and really, I say my father because my mother was um, a silent bystander. She just did not have the ability to step up and, and say anything. I, I really believe in looking back that by the time she had been married to my father for just a few years, that she had become a shell of the person she had been before she married him. It was just a very, living with him just about killed her. I mean, she lived to be 89 and outlived him by almost a decade, but I think she truly died, you know, probably when she was in her early thirties and just lived a very sad um, and painful life. So the roles that my brother and I stepped into were really the roles that my father had dictated for us to have. So as I'd mentioned um, a few minutes ago, my brother ended up dropping out of college when he couldn't play uh, sports at the big level. So he and his wife uh, and their baby moved back to Chattanooga where my father set them up in an apartment and started supporting them 100%. My brother tried to go back to school. Um, he claims that his wife told him she didn't like being at home with the baby and he, he shouldn't be doing that. I, who knows where the truth lies, but needless to say, he did not finish school. He began a series of jobs um, from which he would be fired after anywhere from 18 months to a couple of years. Um, the arrogance that my father had nurtured in my brother because of his athletics and the person that my dad was trying to mold him into, that arrogance did not serve him well when he was having to work for someone else, be someone else's employee. So eventually um, he found himself without a job and really not hireable because his reputation preceded him. Um, now, during all of this, they continued to have children. So eventually there were four children and my, and my brother would be unemployed for sometimes up to a year during which my father would support them. My father also bought them a house <laughs> on, um, in a prestigious area of Chattanooga. Uh, and he paid for him to join the local club, uh, all of which, of course, my brother couldn't afford it because he didn't have an income. Or if he did, it wasn't sufficient to be able to, to do those things. Um, my father also decided to set my brother up in a business. Since he couldn't keep a job working for someone else, maybe he could do well uh, with his own business. And you, and you remember now, all of this is because he's named after the man that's on the pedestal, my dad's father. And under no circumstance can my brother be allowed to fail because that would reflect badly on my father and it would reflect badly on his father, who was the namesake. 
uh, twice. My father paid off the mortgage on the house only to have my brother uh, put more loans on it. Uh, the IRS was after him because he wasn't paying his um, employee expenses. So my dad paid that. When my brother would be out of work for years, they, my parents would empty their freezer and take food up there. And I remember my mother saying, you know, well, it's my grandchildren and I don't want them to starve. And I understand that as a mother, I understand that, that you don't want your children and certainly you wouldn't want your grandchildren to starve. But if people don't have to deal with the consequences of their actions. They will never change. Um, I dealt with the consequences of my action in marrying a person I should never have married by suffering a terrible, terrible loss, um, which I'll talk briefly about in a few minutes. But my brother never did. He never had to uh, because my parents enabled him to not be responsible, enabled him to run a business in the ground, uh, enabled him to not hold on to uh, work. When I was preparing for today to talk to y'all, um, you know, I, I'm trying to hit sort of the high points in some of these chapters. Obviously, I'm not going to sit here and read it all to you, but I, you know, I reread the book to prepare. And in doing that, I came across something that had happened when my father died that I had forgotten about. And I think this is really sort of a good example to show you where having someone not have to be responsible for their actions, where it can take them. My parents um, had moved a couple of years before my father died, had moved from one state where they lived to where I was living, uh, telling me that uh, they wanted to be closer to me so I could, and they said this, take care of them. So uh, my mother had had several strokes. She was not, her, her mind was fine, but her body was grossly impaired. But my father was in pretty good shape. Um, but after they had been there for a couple of years, he was diagnosed with uh, pancreatic cancer, and he only lived for 90 days. So when he was in his terminal illness, uh, my brother would came down to look at their furniture, and he, he walked around the house putting little dots on all the furniture, like these little moving dots you get from moving company, um, announcing that he was going to take all this furniture. Uh, he was going to go to his house, so that's fine. I, I had too much on my plate helping my parents deal with this to argue about it. But he was in town, my brother was in town when my father died. Now my father and my mother had been living with us in his last days. Uh, he had home hospice, but he had had a stroke and we were not able to control his pain level. So the hospice people moved him from our house to residential hospice. And he only lived about 14 hours. But when he died, we all of course were there at the hospice my mother, uh, my brother, myself, my husband, I had remarried, had been remarried for a long time by then. And we were there with the body. And my brother said, well, I'll take our mother back to your house. And uh, I said, that's fine. And so he took her back to the house. And when he got back there, he started rifling through my father's things. Now, my father had been dead about 30 minutes. Here's my mother, who's been married to my father for now like 55 years. She's in mourning. And my brother is rifling through my father's belongings, gets his wallet out, and pulls out the $87 that are in that wallet. And he does this, you know, to mother and says, all I have to have this money to get back to Chattanooga. And left. So, I mean, I, I just think that, you know, that's sad. It's just sad. Um but it, it was shocking to me to read that again and realize where that action had come from. Um, you know, my father was trying to write checks and support my brother until right before he died. Uh, it, and because my brother had stayed stuck, he stayed stuck in the person that he was supposed to be the stellar athlete um, the, the person who could do no wrong. 
and he had allowed that to consume and turn him into who he was. Um, just, it, it was just, it was sad. It was a sad statement. Um, I suffered in other ways um, in listening to that messaging. I had, as I said a few minutes ago, ended up marrying a man I should never have married um, because I, I was listening to that messaging. You know, this is who you're supposed to marry. This will bring you all the things you need to have in life. Well, I found out truly what money and power would do to you. And it was very ugly. Um, he ended up with custody of our children who were very young. I had taken a job in Washington, DC. I had temporary custody. The judge who had been, I later found out, a um, deacon with his grandfather ruled that Washington, DC was an unfit place to raise children. Um, and my, their father, my ex, ended up with them when they were very young. Um, those children suffered some emotional damage. And um, my daughter, who came to live with us afterwards, has done a lot of her own, what I call onion peeling. And she's worked through a lot. Um, I think my son has too. He's just been quieter about it. But it was, was terrible for them. It was terrible for me. Um, I mean, that, that was really the worst thing that could have happened to me. Um, and it was because I had made choices based on that messaging that had been sent to me because it was the messaging my father had had and on and on. I learned a lot uh, uh, during that time about who my friends were, uh, what, fr what true friendship is. And I also learned about shunning. Uh, you know, I was living in a southern town and I would be in the grocery store. I remember once I was in the grocery store and coming towards me pushing a cart was a woman that I knew. I, of course, had known her when I had been married. And she saw me in the aisle and she turned around and walked the other way. Um, there was another woman who I had been friends with. After I moved back from Washington, I'd remarried and when we moved back to Tennessee to try to be closer to these children who were still young. And I had had, had a child with my new husband, so we had moved back uh, to Knoxville. And a woman who had been a good friend of mine, a neighbor uh, that I had spent some time with, you know, pre-divorce and pre-remarriage, et cetera, I called her a couple of times because um, I wanted to get together with her and see her. And when I would be on the phone talking to her, I would hear the receiver on her end being picked up. Well, a couple of weeks later, I get a letter from her telling me that her husband has forbidden her to speak to me or to see me. And would I please never contact her again? So I, I learned a lot about um, the ugly side of people and the fearful side of people. Um, I later learned years later that this woman was an abused woman. Well, she was a, an abused wife. And knowing what I know about how my mother lived with my father under similar circumstances, I understand now why this woman responded to me in the way she did. But at the time, of course, it was very painful. So what I did in response to that indescribable pain was start to drink. Because if I could anesthetize the pain enough, I could continue to function as a person. Um, and I think it's ironic that this September is uh, recovery month because I now have um, 31 years in recovery. But women sometimes and oftentimes will cry line from abusing alcohol to becoming a full-blown alcoholic very quickly. Um, and that's what happened to me in a period of about five years. Now, you would have never known it to know me. Uh, I never got a DUI. I was never drunk in public. I was very successful in my career. Um, but my life was black and I drank every day. Um, I, and it's also appropriate for me to tell you how I became 
uh, not addicted to alcohol. I had a miracle of healing. I uh, had known for some period of time that I was having trouble not drinking. And this was on Easter night in 1990. Um, and I, you know, I prayed to a God I wasn't sure was listening to me anymore and asked to be relieved of the bondage of drink, um, of the compulsion to drink. And I felt a physical lifting of weight off my body. And um, I know, as I sit here today, you know, that was a miracle of healing. And I've not had nor wanted a drink since then. But it was also the beginning of my journey to wholeness, to leave, being able to leave the messaging behind me and look at myself, uh, to be able to look at why I had made choices, to look at um, the things that I had been told were important and to be able to go, well, you know, maybe that's not really true. Um, I, I call it peeling the onion because, you know, when you peel an onion, it, you cry. <laughs> if you've got the right kind of onion, you, you, you're going to cry while you're peeling it. And we can only peel the onion a little bit at a time. So it's, you know, I'm still peeling the onion and it's been over 31 years uh, since that day, but it was what enabled me to start in a new direction. And because I was able to do that, as you'll see when we, when we talk next week, I started making different choices. My brother continued to make unhealthy choices and the, unhealthy choices that he chose started to filter down to his own children because that's what happens with generational messaging. Um, it just goes to the next generation. The subtitle for biologically bankrupt is the sins of the fathers because, you know, we, we've read about it in the Bible. We've heard about it in church um, that the sin, you know, the, the damage that goes from generation to generation and um, it's true, but it certainly happened to be true uh, in my family of origin. Um, I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to go ahead and talk about some of these chapters. And I'd spoken with the producer of um, GMAP about it because it's been incredibly painful for me to go back and look at some of this. Um, you know, I am a healthy person now. Um, I like myself and I don't particularly worry about what other people think about me. But having said that, I think it's human nature to worry about what someone would think of you when you talk about some of the darker parts of your past. But before I started today, I took three deep breaths to center myself and asked for guidance in what I would say so that I would be the conduit uh, for the message that maybe someone who's watching this or will subsequently watch it on uh, YouTube when it's posted on the GMAP channel, um, that it would be something that they need to hear that will be healing for them and helpful. Um, I would encourage you to um, take a look at this book. It, it's on Amazon. Um, I do believe there's a message of healing in it. There's a, mes a message of redemption. And we'll talk about that, how that happened with me and my father um, as we go through this next Tuesday. I hope you'll join me again. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share this message with you. And I hope you have a blessed and wonderful week. Mm -hmm.